Welcome to our first virtual lecture of the season and hopefully there'll be many more because uh, it might be a while before we get to invite you all back into the lecture theatre. Um, we just wanted to get things going again, uh, help with your CPD, help with uh, giving you interesting topics and things to, to attend and we'll have had a difficult year with Covid. Um, apologies the branch has been away for so long but hopefully this will be the start of uh, getting back into a bit of the, the normal routine and if it works quite well we might be able to run lectures like this for, for a while. Um, and tonight we've got Nick Lay, our branch president and a director of engineering aerospace at Kinetic uh, doing a presentation on flight test safety. So I'll, I'll hand over to Nick now and we'll get the presentation underway. Right, good evening everyone and I hope you can hear me as well. So, um, as Mark said, um, this is a, a new beginning for us in terms of delivering our uh, le evening lecture series virtually. I'm delighted to see that we've got um, over 60 attendees at the moment. Um, and equally, it's an opportunity for us um, as a branch to perhaps spread our wings a bit, because the great thing is that the local, of course, becomes truly global uh, thanks to the internet. Um, and so, Whilst this represents a bit of an experiment for us in the branch, um, it also is a great opportunity for us um, to uh, continue to engage uh, with uh, Royal Aeronautical Society members and others uh, worldwide on the topics of, of the day. And so I'd just like to uh, give a little bit more of introduction, as Mark said, uh, Nick Lay. Uh, I um, am currently the uh, engineering director for Kinetics air and space business, including um, uh, the work we do at MLD Boscombe Down um, with the Air and Space Warfare Centre in delivering uh, aircraft test and evaluation. Um, my background um, is as a trials officer, a flight test engineer. Uh, I'm a flight test engineer graduate of the Empire Test Pilot School. And so therefore, the subject I'm talking about tonight flight test safety is one that's dear to my heart and to that of any tester. Um, and so um, without further ado, I'll open up um, and uh, bring you some of my personal reflections uh, on the subject of my career over the last 25 years. So um, the truth of the matter is that um, flight test is a hazardous business um, and um, the challenge for us that um, uh, I, I really want to set out for tonight is we've seen um, over the course of the last several decades aviation safety as a whole improve dramatically. Um, when I uh, went through ETPS as, as, a, as a flight test engineer student, I recall there were seven tornado accidents that year uh, suffered by the Royal Air Force. Thankfully, that's a loss rate um, that is very much uh, in the past and the uh, both military and civil aviation operating environments have become much safer since those days. So if you pass on to the next slide, please, Mark. So what I want to talk about then was to look at, um, firstly, um, the flight test accident rate in comparison with the aviation accident rate and ask, are we improving to the same extent? Then I want to go on and talk about a, a couple of accidents, uh, flight test accidents in particular. Um, and I've selected these because they're notable not just for um, um, the flight test issues that um, occurred uh, in the run up to those accidents, uh, but also for issues of, uh, of flight test management and governance um, and the management of safety in particular. And therefore, I, put, I think um, these two in particular have got a great deal to teach us in terms of the lessons to be learned from them. And I'll go on to talk about uh, the common themes um, between both of those uh, accidents and indeed others uh, and what mitigations uh, we might take from them. And then finally, I want to issue a, a second challenge, which is that how do we ensure that lessons are learned? Flight test is a, an unforgiving business and um, in particular, um, experience is absolutely paramount to ensure that we keep ourselves safe. And that really depends upon the handing on of, of lessons and of experience from one generation to the next. And my question is, 
are we doing, doing that sufficiently effectively? And I will issue one caveat. Learning lessons requires that we understand uh, the causes of recent fatal accidents. But I do reflect that we need to be sensitive to those who are left behind. And I will endeavor to be so tonight. I have taken two accidents which have been investigated by the US National Transportation Safety Board. Um, and the reason for that is simply because um, that provides a rich source uh, of uh, investigative findings and recommendations and a particular level of detail that isn't necessarily available elsewhere. But um, the comments I'm going to make tonight are taken very much directly from those reports and I certainly won't be speculating uh, beyond them. Next slide, Mark. So um, I've actually looked uh, for details of flight test accident rates. There are really no published statistics, but I've actually looked uh, into the data that's available from the US um, uh, Flight Test Safety Committee, and I'll talk about more about that committee later on. Um, and their assessment was that in the last decade, there have been at least 22 test related accidents that they have um, uh, uncovered, uh, of which 11 were fatal and sadly 29 lives have been lost over that period. And a few of the notable ones are, are on, the, on the right hand side here. I'm going to talk about the Gulfstream G60, G650 accident in 2011 and also about the Scale Composites uh, Spaceship 2 accident of 2014. But in Europe, um, many of you may well remember the uh, loss of an Airbus A400M uh, in Spain five years ago. And then we've had um, equal challenges in the rotoring world as well uh, from the Augusta Westland AW609 accident um, in Northern Italy um, and the Bell 525 accident um, uh, in, uh, in the US. Um, so my observation is that flight tax ac accidents continue to happen and they continue to happen at a rate that doesn't appear to me at least to have decreased significantly over the last couple of decades. And yet, as I've mentioned earlier, the overall air aviation accident rate has decreased significantly. So my challenge is, what can we do to improve that situation? And that's the uh, question I'll be endeavoring to answer and um, to take forward some of the lessons from the accidents I'm about to describe um, to ensure that um, we can all act in the flight test community to reduce the risk of the activities uh, that we conduct. Next slide, please, uh, Mark. So the first accident um, I want to discuss tonight um, occurred um, nine years ago now, um, and it was uh, suffered as, uh, by uh, Gulfstream as part of their certification program for uh, a, a new variant of, of the uh, G6 series, the, the Gulfstream G650. And they were conducting uh, one engine inoperative takeoff testing as part of their um, development testing uh, for certification of the of this business jet uh, in Roswell, New Mexico. Uh, and the facts on the day were that the um, uh, right wing stalled uh, at just as the aircraft lifted off the ground. Um, the right wing tip then uh, contacted the runway. Uh, the aircraft departed the runway. It then impacted the concrete, a concrete structure which you can see just to the right in that picture of the uh, of the rightmost airliner parked um, at, the, at the start of that uh, black strip which leads to the uh, ultimate resting point of the aircraft. Uh, there was a post crash fire uh, which sadly was not survivable. Next slide please. So before we get into the into the into the details of exactly um, why, I just wanted to, to recap a little bit about field performance testing and and in particular why it's uh, why it's so important in the certification of civil aircraft because ultimately um, uh, the um, takeoff performance that can be realised has a significant impact on uh, aircraft range and payload from any given uh, runway length. And, and therefore, this is a crucial parameter economically, um, uh, from, uh, particularly from uh, the perspective of uh, airliners, uh, but also in terms of the demonstrable performance. And often um, these are subject to contractual guarantees in terms of performance. So it's absolutely, absolutely critical that, um, the, that um, the correct speeds can be achieved repeatedly and, and indeed the desired performance can be achieved repeatedly. 
Uh, and so just to give you a little bit of the nomenclature, um, uh, when uh, you start the takeoff roll, when you're doing this testing at a speed uh, known as V1, the decision speed, um, and that is the um, highest speed at which you will get, uh, um, you'll elect to abort the takeoff or the lowest speed, if you like, that you'll continue. Um, as part of the certification test, uh, one of the engines is slammed to idle. Then as the aircraft continues to accelerate, albeit more slowly, um, that, that rotation speed, uh, the pilot uh, uh, rotates the aircraft, um, it lifts off, and then the, a crucial performance parameter is takeoff safety speed and achieving that at an altitude of at least 35 feet, feet above the runway surface. So that was the test activity that they were conducting that day, uh, and I think they had, had, had uh, achieved at least 11 such takeoffs um, uh, before uh, the accident sequence. The challenge that this team had was that the Gulfstream G650 was consistently exceeding the targeted V2 speeds, um, and clearly that meant that they weren't achieving optimum performance if they were actually faster at the V2 point um, than scheduled. However, this was turned out to be based upon a flawed assumption. Um, in fact, the scheduled V2 speeds were too low, um, and that was causing the takeoff distances to be uh, longer than predicted. A key challenge that that led to was that that analysis of, of the V2 speeds was not challenged. Instead, the focus of the program became on progressively um, more um, aggressive um, pilot techniques for rotation to try to ensure that the, um, the V2 could be achieved by screen height by 35 feet, um, rather than addressing the root cause of the performance challenge, which was actually the, the determination of that speed itself. Equally of note is that this was all done empirically. There wasn't any simulation or dynamic analysis that was being conducted uh, at, the, at the time of the testing. So the scenario here is in order to hit, meet those performance targets, um, uh, rather than um, reappraise the speeds themselves, this is a, a progressively more uh, aggressive uh, rotation um, uh, techniques that were being used. So next slide, please, Mark. So the right, in, the right wing stalled. So why did that happen? Well, firstly, um, at the rotation point, uh, you clearly are in ground effect. Um, the definition of ground effect varies, but roughly is if you're within two wingspans um, of uh, the surface, then you are in ground effect. And that has some significant effects on the behavior of aerodynamic surfaces. Um, and in particular, at a given angle of attack, um, you develop more lift and, and less drag, um, and that's a, a, a clearly a, a benefit that has been exploited by a number of devices, notably the Russian Ekrano plans. Um, but also, um, it, 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 it impacts on the stall angle of attack, and in particular, it tends to reduce the stall angle of, of attack. Now, um, the data that the um, Gulfstream testing was based upon was actually out of ground attack um, uh, stall AOA measurements, um, and they had been corrected uh, for the effect of uh, being in ground effect, but that correct that uh, correction was insufficient. So I think the correction was about one and a half degrees reduction in stall angle of attack, and it turned out that in reality it was about three and a half degrees, so an extra two degrees um, less angle of attack um, the stall was occurring at. That meant that the stick shaker threshold was too high. Uh, and indeed the pitch limits that they were using were also too high. And that meant that when that wing drop occurred due to the right wing stall, there was no stall warning given to the pilot. The only indication he got was the wing dropping. The other interesting feature is that the accident flight was in fact the third instance of right wing stall that had been experienced during the test program. Now that anomalous behavior of a right wing drop um, and uncommanded roles had, uh, had happened twice before, but they'd never been diagnosed as stall events. And indeed, it appears that they weren't fully investigated in terms of the cause of, of those events and remained fundamentally uh, undiagnosed. So in the context of um, this program, clearly you've got a developing picture uh, of, um, if you like, the symptoms being addressed, but not necessarily some of the other root causes. So moving on uh, to the next slide, please, uh, Mark. 
Uh, and there are some other uh, comments that are made within uh, the NTSB report relating to, to program management. And, and one of them clearly was uh, the pressure of time. And it was noted that there was an aggressive schedule to achieve type certification by the third quarter of, uh, of that year. So this was a, an accident that happened in April and they were targeting the third quarter for um, type certification. And of course, clearly here, they were still doing uh, development work uh, ahead of uh, those FAA uh, formal flight tests. As a result of that schedule, it was observed that there was a, a certain reluctance to challenge key assumptions or to highlight anomalous behaviors um, that, would, that would require investigation and, and clearly further work. And it was noted that the review of the uncommanded role events, the two earlier events, um, was, uh, was superficial in nature. Other comments that were made were that there had been um, some changes made over the years within the Gulfstream Flight Test Department around roles and responsibilities. And in particular, the previous separation between the team involved in conducting testing and the team analyzing the results. And there had previously been a distinct separation between those two teams um, had become blurred and the test team was, its, was doing its own analysis. And of course, the issue that that led to was that it meant that uh, there was no ability to have progressive um, data analysis going on in parallel with the flight test effort that might have actually spotted some of the trends that they were seeing and perhaps started to diagnose some of the underlying issues. Equally, some of the potential hazards weren't fully identified. So the hazard of stall and uh, wing drop at um, at unstick at rotation had not been formally identified. Yes, the risk of, of, of uh, stall out of ground effect had been, but not in ground effect. And the mitigation that was in place was, as you would expect, to, um, uh, to, move, to, to um, take the throttle at idle and restore power and to lower the nose. Um, uh, but clearly, in, in the case of this occurring at rotation, there wasn't sufficient time to do that. And in fact, in the accident sequence, as the wing dropped, um, power was restored on, on the dead engine, so to speak, um, but it was not um, able to achieve um, any um, effect on the accident result. And as a result of that, um, clearly, by, by not actually identifying that particular hazard, there weren't appropriate risk controls uh, in place to, to cover that scenario. One of the things that was noted by the NTSB report um, was about the actions that were taken as a result. And, and whilst um, Gulfstream had a, a, a what we'd call a flight test operations manual, they used a slightly different terminology for it, but while they had a, an FTOM, um, it hadn't been updated for several years and it didn't fully represent um, a, a safety management system. Um, and one of the things that Gulfstream did immediately after uh, in, their, in their response to this accident was to introduce a, an integrated safety management system for their flight test activities. Um, and so the, the NTSB recommendation was, was to actually audit that, that system. But I think, and, and I'll come back to this later on, that is really a fundamental step to assuring um, safe operations in the flight test world, because that provides us with a system within which we can operate to identify hazards um, and to uh, correctly mitigate them um, and to continue to track our safety performance. So that's a, a somewhat sobering example of, um, of an accident in, in a scenario where I, I would say that most people would say, well, um, this is really a performance issue rather than a, 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 a handling quality issue or an edge of the envelope issue. Um, in, within a, a fairly well-known environment, you know, we've got a, a swept wing subsonic uh, business jet. Um, uh, it's got a, um, a fixed leaning edge conventional um, slotted flaps. Now, you might argue that there's not much that's new here um, um, compared with the last 50 years of testing. But as ever, um, um, what you don't know can, can bite you. And, and it's still possible to encounter um, parts of the envelope which um, don't match your expectation. Um, and that's, again, a subject I'll return to um, in a moment. So having looked at the Gulfstream accident, the next one I'd like to look at, and if you can move on to the next slide, Mark, um, is an accident that happened um, uh, uh, three years later. Um, and 
Um, this one is, is relatively well known. It's the accident that happened to um, the scale composites uh, Spaceship 2 um, in late uh, 2014. So um, for those of you who, who um, aren't in the market for a ticket to the edge of space, um, uh, just a brief word on um, the um, suborbital uh, space transportation system that's been developed um, over, over the last uh, decade by um, scale composites and, and Virgin Galactic. So it consists of two elements. There is a white knight uh, carrier aircraft and the spaceship to uh, suborbital vehicle, which you see here on the right hand side. Uh, and the way that the system operates is that um, the white knight two carries the space, sorry, the white knight two carries the spaceship to up to about 45,000 feet, whereupon um, the vehicle, uh, the spaceship two is released from the white knight. It then ignites a solid fuel uh, rocket motor accelerates and climbs um, to almost completely uh, nose up position um, and um, accelerates up to um, the edge of uh, up to the edge of space up to an apogee of around about um, uh, the Kármán line about uh, I think it's about 100 kilometers they get to um, and and then during the reentry phase to uh, to manage the um, thermal loads, to be able to manage the air speeds um, and to uh, prevent flutter, it actually um, has a feathering mechanism, and you can see it on the right hand side in this in this picture of uh, the uh, Starship Two on the ground, with um, its tail uh, uh, its its tails and and um, in the uh, what's called the feathered position, and effectively the idea is it comes down uh, with the body at a very high angle of attack. Uh, of maybe 70 degrees plus, um, providing aerodynamic control um, through the empennage, which of course is seeing a much lower angle of attack uh, and providing that level of drag to assume a, a smooth uh, re-entry. Um, whereupon, um, uh, once it's reached the lower part of the atmosphere, um, it's unfeathered again and glides conventionally uh, to uh, a landing, an unpowered landing. So that's how the uh, system is uh, designed to operate. And the feathering mechanism is central to um, this uh, design solution, um, which covers uh, an enormously wide range of speeds and, and altitudes. Um, and therefore, you end up with very high mark number behavior at very uh, low air speeds, uh, low, um, that's um, equivalent air speeds. So we move on to the next slide uh, and to um, the um, issues that happened on this particular day. So this is a power flight uh, uh, during uh, the development of uh, Space 2, which is the, the, the passenger carrying vehicle uh, conducted from uh, Mojave in California, north of Edwards. Um, and as per uh, design, Spaceship 2 was released from White Knight at just over 46,000 feet and the rocket was ignited. Now the feather system um, that um, operates to move the empennage up to that vertical position you saw earlier um, was scheduled to be unlocked during the boost phase at um, Mark 1.4. Um, and I'll talk about why um, that became the um, target to um, unlock uh, the feathering system uh, later on. Unfortunately, the feathering system was unlocked prematurely at, at Mark 0.9, and at that particular speed, the um, loads on the um, uh, on the empennage were such um, that it caused the um, feathering system to activate um, and overpowered the uh, actuators, um, and it and the feather system extended during the boost phase um, at just above Mark 0.9. That led to a um, severe pitch up and catastrophic structural failure. By miracle, the pilot survived this accident. Um, uh, he came to um, clear of the air vehicle um, in free fall um, uh, uh, and was aware of, of being at some significant altitude. This is a, a, a break up at 46,000 feet. Um, and um, he then uh, came to again uh, after the parachute had automatically opened um, and, uh, and thereafter landed. He was. He was uh, um, seriously injured, but did survive uh, the accident. Sadly, uh, the co-pilot didn't. So moving on to the, on to the next slide and talk about this feathering mechanism. So the challenge that the design had was that the uh, failure to feather um, uh, during uh, re-entry um, would risk high G loads, high speeds, flutter and high heat loads. And so it was critical 
um, to mitigate those risks that the feathering mechanism must be able to operate. And in order to ensure that it would be able to operate, um, they, uh, the, the procedure was to unlock the feathering mechanism before Mark 1.8, because at Mark 1.8, um, if, it was, if, if they had not uh, achieved unlock by that, that time, they would therefore be able to shut off the rocket motor um, and conduct a conventional return to Earth, um, obviously without hitting that significant apogee um, at lower altitudes and conduct a safe uh, landing uh, in unfeathered uh, glide mode. Um, but if they were above Mark 1.8, uh, then, then clearly they were going to be experiencing uh, greater reentry speeds and temperatures, uh, etc. So that led to a significant uh, time constraint um, because, as you can imagine, uh, once that rocket is lit, you are accelerating pretty rapidly. So um, the call out, um, uh, so, so the, the co pilot had a number of tasks to complete within a fairly short period of time. He had to call out uh, Mark, or Mark 0.8, which occurred about eight to 10 seconds after the rocket was lit. He then had to call out the trim settings because the, the trims change significantly, as you might expect, from subsonic to supersonic flight. Um, and that would be about two seconds later. And then he had to unlock the feathering mechanism at Mark 1.4, but no later than Mark 1.5 or 1.6, because there, there, there was a warning system, um, uh, which would occur about a further uh, 12, uh, uh, 12 or uh, 13, sorry, 13 or 14 seconds later. So a number of tasks that had to be completed in pretty short order. And it was clear that on this flight, he anticipated um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the correct speed of Mark 1.4 to be able to operate this feather mechanism. Um, and whether through a, a cognitive failure or otherwise, um, the um, uh, feather mechanism was unlocked at, at 0.8 Mark or just after um, with those catastrophic consequences. Next slide. So, the um, issue I think that comes uh, out of this um, is one of uh, human factors, in fact, because of course it became um, uh, possible for uh, uh, a single uh, inadvertent pilot action to cause a catastroph catastrophic failure um, of um, the uh, complete vehicle. Um, and, and so the question is, well, how come there, there, a dis there was a design in place um, that uh, permitted uh, such a catastrophic effect from, from one action. And interestingly enough, the NTSB noted that there, there was an FAA waiver in place from software and human error certification requirements. And, and to be fair, this was being conducted and, under experimental um, uh, permissions. Um, and um, it was also noted that the hazard identification that had been carried out didn't consider the possibility of the feathering mechanism being unlocked prematurely. It was considered that um, as a, an experienced um, operator, um, the co-pilot would always unlock at the appropriate point during the flight. Interesting enough, human factors as a topic wasn't identified in scaled composites design or procedures, their hazard analysis or their simulator training. Um, and so therefore, um, any um, uh, human uh, failure to, to act exactly as required was never considered in any of their, in their, in their, in their analysis. The other thing that the, the, um, uh, the, the NTSB also noted was that the civil space regime was immature. And in fact, um, Virgin Galactic has been a pioneer in this regard. And so therefore, there was a lack of human factors guidance for commercial space operators. They also noted that, again, because of the novelty of the regime, uh, there was limited FAA inspector uh, familiarity with the, uh, with the subject of commercial space operations. And whilst a, a commercial space uh, lessons learned database had been established um, about four years earlier, um, it was it was incomplete, um, not not uh, not surprisingly, given the fairly immature state of the of, of of the market. I guess my reflection on this is that, of course, whilst um, those um, civil that civil space regime might have been immature, um, this particular speed regime, transonic, um, uh, forty six thousand feet is absolutely not novel um, and one where uh, both military and civil operators have been have been um, uh, addressing the, the, this particular region of the envelope for for decades so one of the questions i ask myself is well you know it, given that the immaturity of the commercial space um, arena 
um, did, were they not looking to um, similar areas um, of, of expertise, uh, clearly notably high altitude military flying, um, in order to be able to um, ensure that they learnt lessons from the broadest possible spectrum. Um, that's not commented on by the NTSB, um, but um, it, it, it's certainly an area um, that uh, of of um, uh, of questioning about. Okay, do we look? Um, and this is sort of a, a reflection I make to ourselves, uh, the flight test community. Do we look so outside our own little bubble and look across and what others are doing and whether we can learn the lessons from them? So that concludes um, the uh, the two accidents I wanted to uh, discuss tonight. Um, and so I just want to talk next about um, what we might learn from those accidents in particular, given the fairly detailed analysis we've had we, uh, we've had the benefit of a bit of. So if you move on to the next slide, Mark, I think there, there are three key areas which I think are brought out by both of these accidents. The first one is about uh, safety management. And I think that my reflection as the director of an organization that conducts test activities is that this absolutely requires top-down leadership commitment to ensuring that we are doing everything that we can to manage hazardous activities safely. Um, and that needs to be an absolutely um, unexpurgated me message that is really clearly understood throughout the organization. And safety management systems need to become the way that we run our business. And in fact, um, it's almost, um, you, you could strike out the word safety and just put management systems because it's those systems that enable us to, in a um, predictable uh, and repeatable way, ensure that we maintain safe outcomes. The second thing I would also um, uh, take away from these two accidents is the subject of risk assessment. Now that's the cornerstone of safety management. It absolutely needs collective understanding because that hazard identification process is absolutely critical to being able to manage the risks. And that means we need to source that identification of hazards from the widest possible area. We need to involve the entirety of the team, not just particular individuals within it. Um, and we need to pay continued attention to how we mitigate those risks, particularly in a developing arena where we might be making discoveries as we go along. And we need to continuously recheck that our mitigations remain effective. And finally, I think both of these accidents showed shortcomings um, in, in modeling and simulation. In respect of, of the Gulfstream accident, it was the lack of um, uh, theoretical um, uh, uh, analysis that underpin, underpinned their, their, what they were doing. And then in the case of the Spaceship 2 accident, um, it was the fact that their simulation didn't encompass uh, variability of, of human performance. So it's, uh, for me, it's key to understanding both the physics and the impact of the human um, on uh, operations and ensuring that we have effective mitigation. So now I want to come to the second question uh, that I asked uh, around uh, this topic tonight, which was around how do we ensure that lessons are learned? And I thought I'd, I'd divide this into our roles and what we might expect of ourselves in our roles. Um, uh, and so starting from the top, what do we as directors of test activity uh, need to ensure um, to, to need to do to ensure that lessons are learned? And fundamentally to this, as, as I evidenced earlier, um, was the need for all flight test organizations to operate in accordance with the safety management system. I think that's an absolute fundamental pillar to, to safe operations. Equally, we also need to ensure that learning from experience is embedded into our organizations with the right tools and the right resources to ensure that that can happen. Looking down at the next level of those of us who manage within environments that are set by uh, our directors, what do we need, what do we as managers need to do to ensure that uh, lessons are learned? I've conducted uh, test and evaluation in the UK, um, in France and in the US, uh, and in fact both under US Navy and US Air Force um, uh, protocols. Um, and the one thing that I do like about the uh, US system is the use of grade beard reviews. Um, and uh, that to me gives you an opportunity to gain independent insight uh, from a broad spectrum of, um, of experience and apply that to individual programs. Secondly, we all need to look outside of our organizations 
any organization can become insular and consider itself to be uniquely positioned to address the challenges it faces. But you can find analogs in sometimes unexpected places. Um, and I certainly encourage everyone to look outside, to look at other operations and see how, how other people deal with the same risks. And finally, for us as individuals, for me, lessons, learning lessons, particularly in an environment, a high hazard environment where experience absolutely counts, is all about a commitment to lifelong learning. Um, that means learning from experience. That means understanding the impact of human factors and learning about that. And that's something that um, for all our people within Kinetic who operate within the defense aviation environment, we conduct um, human factors training to ensure that people understand the fallibility of the human condition and how we need to manage it. And finally, continued professional development is a core part of ensuring that we keep our skills refreshed and it provides us the opportunity to learn lessons. And I think my final point is that these days, the resources available to be able to look into this are, are fantastic compared with what I experienced when I first started work in flight test and had my um, A4 box full of um, photocopied news newspaper articles and, and, and uh, Aviation Week articles, uh, which uh, I used to refer back to when I wanted to, to consider lessons that have been learned from other programs. And I just want to recognize some of these. Um, and a number of them are from the US, and I, I really do think that the openness that is displayed in the US flight test community is commendable. Um, the first one is uh, the Flight Safety Foundation, and in particular, um, the Aviation Safety Network, which actually composes a, a Wikipedia, if you like, or, or a, a wiki base um, of every aviation accident since the dawn of aviation, um, so far as the uh, collective can, 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 uh, can put it together, including a large number of accidents relating to, to flight test activities. The second one, as I've already mentioned, uh, is the Flight Test Safety Committee, um, uh, and that is a, a construct put together by the Society of Experimental Test Pilots, the Society of Flight Test Engineers, um, and the AIAA, the uh, American Institute of uh, Astronautics and Aeronautics, um, as a specific vehicle for um, the uh, distribution and dissemination of, of flight test safety material uh, and lessons learned. And in fact, of note, the NTSB has actually made recommendations to the Flight Test Safety Committee for the distribution and dissemination of that kind of information. Uh, and they've got a great monthly newsletter and a podcast channel. And um, a, a, an old colleague of mine, uh, Turbo Tomasetti, who I first met 20 years ago in the early days of John Strike Fighter, chairs that organization and is unstinting uh, in his work to, to promote it. And I, and I really do think that's a hugely valuable effort. Another great resource is NASA's uh, Flight Test Safety Database, which really contains a whole um, library of test hazard, test hazard analyses, which can be brought together to um, uh, be able to compare um, their hazard identification with the hazard identification applicable to your particular scenario. And equally, I need to call out the learned societies, the SETP, the SFTE, and indeed the Royal Aeronautical Society's own, own flight test group. And finally, uh, NATO, their flight test technical team has got some great resources as well. So just use the, um, uh, this web search engine of choice. Um, and if you search on, the, on those topics, you'll find great resources. And it's behoven on all of us, I think, to, to um, make use of that to ensure that we um, personally uh, learn the lessons. And that, I think, is the best memorial to, we can give to the crews who have died in the service of of expanding uh, our understanding of aerospace over the last decade. Ultimately, these lessons have been bought very expensively and therefore we need to learn them. Thank you very much for your attention this evening. Um, uh, and um, I'm hoping now that uh, we'll be able to open the floor um, to questions, which I'd be delighted to answer. Thank you very much for that, Nick. It was a really, really interesting lecture. Um, always some sad points in 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 there in that type of lecture but as you said we we can learn from those things uh, i've got a question to get things going and give people a chance to type in the q a box um in your roles over the years in flight test and then moving up to being a director of air and space and have, being an accountable manager is there anything that you've seen uh, a flight test safety incident uh, accident over the years that has led you to implement um, 
any changes in the way we work. Um, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. There are, there are a number of, of areas where I have uh, learnt from uh, previous accidents um, and I think the first thing I would say um, is to expect the unexpected uh, because um, that is the one thing I can say with some certainty is that um, it, 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 it tends to have been areas which were not considered to be the most hazardous that have caused some of these accidents. And so it's not a specific accident, I'd say, but more of a state of mind that says that one of the things we need to be really careful about is all of the hazards that we've identified, because it's not necessarily the ones that we uh, have had the most prominent um, that have bitten us. Okay, thank you, Nick. Um, I, I think the, the easiest way to do this might be um, if I read the questions out from the Q&A to you. Yeah, I'm delighted. Uh, okay, so we've got one. Uh, from Andrew Barber, that's just a, a comment saying, very useful lecture, thank you. We've got a comment from, a uh, question from Stuart B. Safety costs, but accidents cost more. Do companies put enough effort into understanding the costs and benefits? So that, that's a, a key part of um, uh, the ALARP principle or the uh, ensuring that your risks are as low as reasonably practical. That's a legal requirement in the UK um, and if as a manager I consider that the risks involved in any hazardous operation are not as low as reasonably practical then I'm in breach of the UK's Health and Safety at Work Act. So this is absolutely fundamental and the test that the Health and Safety at Work Act applies is that the cost of um, uh, rectifying an unsafe situation must be grossly disproportionate. And that's quite a high bar. And so that's something that um, I certainly uh, look at with regularity, which is um, what, uh, uh, you know, what, where could we spend and is that spend out of proportion to the risk reduction that we achieve? Um, and that requires, actually, it requires us to look at that on, a, on an ongoing basis because there may well be technological improvements that immediately enable me at reasonable cost to be able to retire risks or to be able to mitigate them more effectively than I can today. Um, and so it's actually um, an area I ask myself regularly. In fact, I ask my team. And one of my favorite questions is, if I gave you £100,000 tomorrow to spend on safety, what would you spend it on? Because that starts people thinking, I think, positively about uh, safety and about how we can how we can better mitigate it, rather than the other route, which is that I've only got a limited budget. Um, um, how can I how can I best spend that? Sometimes we need to look at it from the other end of the telescope. Okay, thanks, Nick. Uh, we've got a question from Tim C. Uh, Scale Composites had a fatal rocket test accident earlier on in the program. Does this suggest that the lessons of that have not caused enough change in the management of safety? Yes, I, I, I remember that accident um, uh, again at, at Mojave. Um, I'm afraid I haven't seen uh, the test report into that um, uh, that ground-based test accident, um, uh, which clearly um, w w was a, a very different activity. So I, I don't really feel I can comment on on whether that reflected a, a, a particular uh, culture. Um, but I, I think that um, it, it, one of the things that it, it does show or to, would bring out from that accident is, that, is the huge importance of um, of understanding and catering for the human in the machine um, because um, that's why for me human factors is such an important topic. Um, I, I don't like talking about pilot error because it's, it's not necessarily any pilot error at all. It's the way that we work as humans and making sure that we are taking that into account in all of our test activities. Okay. A uh, question from Rhys. Thanks for the session. Do you think that given the large number of EV toll and less conventional aircraft, particularly those from non-aerospace companies, we are likely to see an increase in flight test incidents? That's a really good point uh, because it's a novel arena, uh, as you rightly say, with a lot of new participants um, and um, a lot of novel configurations as well and some of which you look at those configurations and you do ask yourself questions about um, their uh, resilience to uh, single point failures, uh, robustness I should say to single point failures. Um, and so 
um, I absolutely do see uh, uh, that, that safety threat um, and that's one of the reasons why I think we need to make sure that we're encompassing uh, as wide a community as possible um, in, in, in flight test safety. The one thing I would say is that I know of um, a number of um, talented um, uh, test pilots and engineers who are working with those companies uh, and so certainly um, that expertise is being applied in that environment and I really hope they are able to safely develop their products. Thank you again Nick. Uh, we've got one from Rob now. Hi Nick, you mentioned passing on lessons learned. Can this all be done with documents and models or is consistency of staff for person-to-person -person learning also required? That's a really good point. I think it's it's a combination of, of, of the two um, and I think that means that we need to make sure um, as organisations um, that we do pass on our know-how from from generation to generation uh, and, and let's be clear um, accidents are, are thankfully rare um, I've, I've pointed out that that um, we appear to be plateauing um, from my perspective anyway in terms of flight test accidents but that still doesn't make them common events um, and therefore um, you know there is a great deal of time um, over which a lot of these activities occur particularly if you're looking for across the breadth of experiences um, and so any one individual may not come across some of these hazards um, and that's why corporate memory is so uh, important. And, and I, when I say corporate memory, I don't mean within an existing uh, company necessarily. I mean across the community of testers, um, because we need to ensure that the lessons do make it across company boundaries. One of the challenges we have is a lot of companies view um, their, their flight test methodologies as proprietary information, for example, and that does limit uh, the dissemination of, of, of safety outcomes, in my view. Uh, one of the things I think we do need to continue to work towards is a culture of openness um, uh, and, and sharing and reporting of, of where um, we have, we have um, experienced um, problems and in particular in cases where um, uh, we have made mistakes because it's only by learning from other people's mistakes that we can prevent ourselves from repeating them. So yes, um, uh, I do think that it's a combination of of, of studying, of, 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 of reading reports, because there's a great deal of insight to be gained from them, and having that um, human interaction. Okay, I think we'll take uh, one more, and uh, I wanted to make a little point about the calendar, and then we'll call it, uh, call it a night there, Nick, if that's all right with you. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so Scott Vaughan uh, has asked, with the increasing prevalence of novel architectures and increasingly complex systems in the industry, how do you foresee we as an industry will guard against the novel failure modes that these might give rise to during flight test campaigns? Well, I think that by, its, by, its, by definition, of course, flight test is always novel. Um, and and my, my simple answer to that question is um, model, simulate and predict and do it again and do it again and do it again. And in particular, uh, make sure you're accounting for uh, variability in as many variables as you possibly can. Um, uh, and then train like you fight. So um, the, for the past 20 years, as far as I'm concerned, um, uh, best practice is to simulate every test before you do it, um, such that you know what to expect and then particularly you can detect where you're diverging from what you had expected to see and it can take rapid, um, uh, uh, respond rapidly to any deviation from expectation because that's where the risks lie. Um, and so um, yes, well, no, for the very reason that we're conducting novel activities, they will always be hazardous. Um, but for me, it's analyze, 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 prepare, prepare, prepare. Uh, and I remember um, listening to um, Captain um, Eric Brown, um, the renowned uh, Royal Navy uh, test pilot, um, uh, who uh, survived perhaps the most hazardous um, test flying uh, period of the early 1950s. And his argument as to how he survived and many others didn't was all about his preparation. Okay, thank you very much for that, Nick. Uh, once again, interesting lecture. And thank you to everyone that joined us tonight. I think we have 64 attendees I can see on the screen. So that's, that's quite a good number. Um, hopefully we will be able to be doing more of these in the future. Um, Definitely took us a while to get to grips with the system, um, but I think it went pretty well tonight. Um, we'd like to hear 
feedback from from people that have been watching just to let us know if there's anything that can perhaps be improved on and once again thank you very much i hope you all enjoyed it have a good christmas and new year and stay safe <laughs>